Good morning. Happy New Year. How are we doing this new year? Good? Good. You know, I love a new year because it's like a new start on life, right? And um, as a Christian, you have the fortunate opportunity that every day can be like a new year because God says his mercies are new every morning. Amen? So you don't have to wait a whole year. You just got to get up in the morning. That's it. But I like a new year because a new year is kind of like this blank slate. It's all new. There's new potential, new opportunities. In fact, how many of you today are wearing something that you got new for Christmas? Raise a hand. Yeah, you look sharp. I'm wearing something new. What do you think, huh? Like the outfit? It's good. I got compliments already. You know, behind a, best dre- uh, a good dressed man is always a better dressed woman. This is uh, my wife's style here. She bought me this shirt, and I like it too. It's nice. I love it. Huh? Don't you? It's good. My wife is um, impressing me this year because she came out with some New Year's resolutions that she um, shared with me the other day, and I was just like taken aback. I said, wow, this is awesome. This is my wife's New Year's resolutions. Uh, first one, be patient with everyone, especially family. Uh, that's good. That's good. She said, she's going to take time every day to play with the kids. Second one, that's good. Never walk by a sink full of dishes and say to yourself, someone else will do it. Okay. <laughs> Stop eating late in the evening before bedtime. Give thanks at all times and don't complain. Remember that many people have it worse than you. And lastly, pray a lot more and trust God with all your heart. And when she told me these goals, I said, well, they're great goals. I said, but do you think you can accomplish all of these goals in one year? And she said to me, why should I? These are for you. (laughs) I guess I got my work cut out for me, don't I? (laughs) You know, it reminds me of Zig Ziglar. He tells a story of a 65-year-old woman who in the beginning of the year, watched an exercise tape. And she watched this tape, and she became very excited to get herself in shape. So she came out to her family and said, I am going to walk five miles a day every day. And her family was not encouraged by this. They said, you're 65 years old. Why don't you at least start with one mile a day? She said, no, five miles a day every day. And she stuck to her goal. Today, she is 83 years old, and her family has no idea where she is. (laughs) It's good to laugh. Did you know that God is a God of joy? I think Christians who are stuffy are probably the worst representation of who God is. It's time to smile and have laughter and joy. We got the best promises in the world. We have an amazing God. And today I want to talk to you about God's amazing plans for our lives and the power to change. You see, God has a very big goal for his church. It's what the business world calls a bag, a big Hairy, audacious goal. You ever hear that term? It means a goal that's so big that people from the outside say it's not possible. But there's a glimmer of hope on people on the inside that say, you know what? I think there's a possibility. What's your bag? What's the big vision that God has in your heart? God's bag is this. God has a goal. To reach the entire world. And that's a very big goal for these reasons. Jesus took a group of guys who had never left their surrounding area and told them to go out into all the world. They had never gone any further than their feet had walked or than their boats had taken them. And now he's telling them, go into the world. Secondly, he's telling them to make disciples. He's not just saying, hey, Promote a campaign on Twitter. Get followers. Get people to like you. He's saying, make people who are committed to my teachings, devoted to following me. Thirdly, the people who were called to make disciples, they weren't much of disciples themselves. They were untrained, unschooled, fishermen, tax collectors. They weren't the type of guys that you would recruit for a big, hairy, audacious goal. Which brings us to the second reason it was big, hairy, and audacious, which is this, the people that God chose. God chose unreliable, 
individuals to accomplish his big goal. Just think through the list. Judas is already gone because he betrayed Jesus and then took his own life. Peter says, I'll never deny you. Then goes and denies the Lord three times. And he's going to lead the early church? Thomas says, I won't believe the resurrection unless I actually touch Jesus' wounds. All the disciples, this Jesus, at his toughest hour, other than John. And they recruit this guy named Saul, who we know as Paul, who was a persecutor of Christians. I spent 12 years in corporate America, and I was a project manager. And when I got a big task, a big goal, my first question was, who's on my team? Because when you have a big, hairy, audacious goal, you need the best of the best to accomplish that goal. If it wasn't challenging enough, in addition to having people who were unreliable, there were many diverse, cir ooh, slide, diverse circumstances, perfect for it to fall. There we go. Diverse circumstances. You had a religious environment with people who Jesus came to minister to. They rejected him. The people who knew the Jews' face the most rejected the one who came to save them. You had a political environment, and if you think you got it bad in this country, my, my. These people would kill you and not think twice. They'd whip you and then whip you again. They'd imprison you, and there was no talking about your rights. If anything came in the way of their political agenda, you're on the chopping block. And if that's not bad enough, how many know that? Satan and all his minions were not very happy about this thing called the Great Commission and these people who are Jesus' followers. There was a lot of opposition. Now, if you ask me, if you got a big, hairy, audacious goal, unreliable people, and unfavorable circumstances, is that an equation for changing the world? What do you think? Would you want to be assigned that task? Does not look promising at all, Steve. In fact, my suggestion is that with this equation, it's a predictable failure. They were bound to fail. This was a setup for failure. And when you're in this predicament, you realize that if you want to change this F to an A, and succeed and change the world, then at least one, if not all of the components here, must change. Are you with me? Say amen. amen. So God had to make a choice. God either had to choose to change the goal. Now, he could take that goal. Instead of making it such a high goal, he could lower the bar and standard. Hey, let's not go out into all the world. Let's just stick to Jerusalem possible. Let's not try to reach all people. Let's stick to the Jews. Option. Forget this whole disciple thing. Let's just teach people to be nice. Isn't nice nice? What's wrong with nice? He could have lowered the goal. God could have changed the people. He could take unreliable people and make them reliable. Unskilled people make them skilled. Untalented people make them talented. He could change the people. Lastly, he could change the circumstances. God could have just put the mute button on Satan. <laughs> Satan, all his lies, <laughs> done. God could have looked at all the evil people in the world. Nero, <laughs> gone. He could have went down the list. He could have sucked sin out of the world. All the temptation, take it away. But guess what? What do you think God decided to change? Here's the interesting thing. In your life, 
My guess is that more than one of you want your life to be different in some positive way. Can you raise your hand? Okay. Anyone who didn't have their hands raised? All right, because you can get up here and preach if you want. Because we want to know your tricks. And typically, what happens is this. I face a situation in which I don't like my world the way that things are. And the two primary places that I go after to change and that I pray about the most are God change the goal. Give me a little grace. Cut me some slack. Does it have to be so hard, Lord? And if I'm not changing the goal, I want the circumstances to change. God, would you just change all the annoying people in my life? Could you rid me of the annoyance? Am I the only one? <laughs> and at times, God says, I'm going to lower the standard. I'm going to lower the bar. And at times, God removes circumstances in our life through prayer. He changes things. Yes, he does. But here's an always. Are you ready for an always? Now, it's dangerous to say either always or never because those are exclusive terms. No matter what your circumstances is and no matter what your world is and no matter how much of a failure it seems to be today, God is always in the business of changing people. And guess who people is? Everybody say with me, I'm people. I'm people. Now, if God's going to change people so that they can change the world, he's got to do four things. The four Ps. The first P is this. God has to give them power. He's got to give them strength, ability, might. You know that, er. He's got to give them power. He's got to give them a battery for their new car toy they got at Christmas. You got to have power. But power is not enough. Do you know that this week, there will be a rush of people headed into the gym. <laughs> and at this time next month, there will be half as many people. <laughs> now, let me ask you a question. The people who don't show up in February, did they have any less ability than they did in January? They had the strength. They could have got out of bed, but they looked at their clock, they contemplated the options, and they hit the snooze button. Is it because they lacked power? No. They lacked passion. And why do you stop the goals that God puts on your heart? It's because you lose motivation. Not because you lose the ability. And that's why it's so important to keep yourself encouraged in the Lord, to read things that lift your spirits up. Because discouragement is like the common cold. Everybody's had it at least once. So you don't need just power. You need passion. And passion isn't enough either. You need some proficiency. Like if you're going to get in shape, you need to know how to use the equipment. You need to have some skills. You need some talent. And these disciples, if they're going to change the world, they need some talent. And finally, you need personality. And by that, I don't mean you need to be a big personality, but you have to have character. Because if you do a great thing for God, but you have a crack in your foundation of character, then all those things you did could slowly seep down the crack. So God had to empower these people with the godly character to back up the gifting and the passion and the power that he was giving them. Are you with me? So the question then becomes, how does God change these people and empower them with all of these attributes of power, passion, proficiency, personality in such a way that accomplishes a big, hairy, audacious goal such as changing the entire world? How's he going to do it? Look with me, if you will, to the book of Acts, chapter 1. 
verses starting in, uh, let's start verse 4. Let's start in verse 4, okay? On one occasion, while Jesus was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem was home base for them. But wait for the gift my father promised. So this is the original American Express, don't leave home without him. Boys, I already know the predicament you're going to be in if you try to do this task without my power. He says, which you heard me speak about, for John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Interesting thing here is this. Jesus spoke to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, and he said, there's a birth that happens from water, natural, childbirth, and then there's a birth that happens from the Spirit, which is when a person is born again. And Jesus is saying, look, there's also a baptism that's by water, and then there's a baptism that's by the Spirit. He goes on further, and he says in verse 6, then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his authority, but you will receive what? Power. So here's the promise. They're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you'll be my witnesses. So what's the purpose for the power? It's to be a witness. In Jerusalem, home base, Judea, spreading out, Samaria, going further, ends of the earth. So what Jesus is saying is this. There was a time in the Old Testament where you would hear about the Holy Spirit coming upon a person for a certain task and a certain ability, and that was good. The Holy Spirit came upon people. And then we also see that the Holy Spirit filled people. And when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, it's refreshing. It's like a shower. And when he fills you, it's like this empowerment. And you can do good. But Jesus says, look, Holy Spirit's not just going to come upon you anymore. He's not just going to come in you. But I want you to live your life this way. I want you to be baptized in my spirit. And that word baptism means immersed, submerged, engulfed. And you know, things change when you're underwater, don't they? Your buoyancy changes. Your ability to move back and forth changes. Things started to change for these disciples. They got baptized in the Holy Spirit. They started speaking differently. They started speaking with different types of languages and tongues. And I know that might freak some of you out. But check it out. You go underwater and try to talk. See what it sounds like. ba ba be ba 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 be ba 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 Something changes when you get soaked. And like Joyce Meyer says, once you're in over your head, it doesn't matter how deep you go. And Jesus says, there's a baptism of the Spirit. And when you get baptized in the Spirit, you all wonder if I'm going to drink that, right? No. Things start to change. Your life becomes different. You receive power. And that's what God wants to do in your life. He wants to give you power to accomplish God's goals. You need power. How many could admit they need more power in their life? God, we welcome your power today. We welcome your power. We want your power. But remember, you can't just have power. You got to have what? Passion. You got to have passion. And Romans 5 says this. Such hope in God's promises never disappoints us because God's love has been abundantly poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who is given to us. What is our passion? It's God's love in our hearts. Now, this is a very special pillow to me. You don't hear many men talk about a special pillow. Isn't that cute, right? But why is this a special pillow? Because a couple years back, I had heart surgery, and this is what they give out to all the heart surgery patients. And on the back, you see all the nurses signed it. Isn't that? Yeah, I hear the awes. Come on, bring it up. Come on. That's good. Oh, that's good. That was a sentimental moment there. Why do they give you this pillow? Because when they cut you open or crack you open, whatever way you go, 
when you have to cough, <coughs> starts to hurt. And you want as much comfort and love and good feelings and chicken soup as you can get because it hurts. How many know we got a hurting world? You think we need any more hatred? Judgmentalism. Criticalness. Negativity. How about a little love? How about a lot of love? And what God says in his word is that he fills us with his love. God, give us your love should be our heart cry. God, I don't want to love with my love. <sighs> Help me to love with your love. I love this translation. It says, let love be your highest goal. But you should also desire special abilities. All right, we're moving on now. You got to have love, but it just can't just be ushy gushy lovey. You got to have some proficiency. You got to have some ability. You got to have some might to put that love into action, right? It's not just feeling good and helping others feel good, but you got to do something to show that you love. God demonstrated his love. But you should also desire special abilities the Spirit gives, especially the ability to prophesy. Now, God wants us to have special abilities. Now, this is one of my toolboxes. How many men love their toolbox? Just give, a, give me a nod. Yeah, yeah, you know that, right? You know it's true. And how, many, how many men love Home Depot? How many are there more than they're at their actual home? I walk in and they say, hello, Mr. E. That's when you know you've been there too often, you know? But I like Home Depot, and I like tools. Because tools make life easier, don't they? So I'm going to show you some of my tools today. I got Dennis on the front row here. Dennis, help me learn about some of these tools. I knew this one, though, Dennis. Hammer. It's my kid's hammer. It's a good one. Hammers are good for pounding stuff in. Let's see what else I got here. Oh, I got one of these things. What do you call this, D? Level. A level, right. You know, last night when people got pulled over for driving a little swervy? <laughs> the cops just give them one of these. Hold the bubble in the middle. What else I got here? Now, I've learned that if you're going to put any drywall up, you need one of these guys, right, D? These are good. But my favorite in all of this are my power tools. (laughs) You can strip a man of everything, but just don't take away his power tools, you know? See, because you can use a screwdriver, and it'll work. And I'm kind of wimpy. I get those blisters in my palm. You ever get one of those guys? Guy things. Ladies, just, you know, turn that too much. But when you got one of these, life gets fun. It's a guy moment. Here's the thing. God's given us tools, abilities, skills, gifts, talents to accomplish the goal of reaching the world. How are we going to do it? With our bare hands? With the gifts of the Spirit. Let's look what it says in 1 Corinthians here. Now to each one, that means all of us, nobody excluded. This isn't just to the people who are in full-time ministry, the people who seem real spiritual. This is to each one. Look at your neighbor. Tell your neighbor, you have gifts. To each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Why is the Spirit given? For the what? Common good. It's for all of us. It's not so you look good, but it's for the common good. Why am I teaching? It's for all of our good. 
To one, there's given through the Spirit a message of wisdom, the wise guys in the church. To another, a message of knowledge, words of knowledge by the same Spirit. To another, faith, the ability to believe. To another, gifts of healing, gifts plural, many types of healing, physical, emotional, relational, healing gifts. That by one Spirit. Who's giving them out? It's the Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. Don't you like that one? Put that one on your 2017 Christmas list, huh? To another, prophecy, being able to speak forth. To another, distinguishing between spirits, discernment. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. It's there again. You'd have to cut out a lot of parts of the Bible if you're going to exclude the supernatural. You'd have a really holy Bible. And to still another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same, who? Spirit. And he distributes them. Who distributes them? The Spirit to each one, just as who determines? The Spirit. Let's look at the next verses. We have different gifts. Look, these guys are different. They have different functions. They have different purposes. You don't want to try to screw something in with a level. Or try to hammer something with a level. Now what I've found is that God will use a willing person even if that person isn't gifted in an area. God can use us to tap a little nail from time to time if he can't find a hammer who's available. See, my shoulders, their intention, their purpose is to rotate my arms. But if my hands are busy, my head calls for the shoulder to help if I got an itch on my ear. You with me? You guys thought I was dancing there a little bit. I'm not dancing. So you might have a particular function, but sometimes God calls you to operate outside of that function because he's called us to be servants according to the grace given to each of us. So that grace could be in a particular moment. It could be all your life. If your gift is prophesying, now this is a really simple Bible lesson here. If it's prophesying, then prophesy. Oh, who would have thought? In accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then what? Serve. If it's teaching, then what? Teach. If it's in, to encourage, then give encouragement. Giving, what are you going to do? Give generously. Leading, lead diligently. Show mercy, do it cheerfully. Here's the point. Whatever your gift is, use it. It doesn't matter if it's a big shiny gift that all people get to see. It doesn't matter if it's a fancy power tool. Or if it's just a little bit of a tiny uh, little screwdriver. Or whatever this thing is. I don't know. It doesn't matter. The point is, know your gift and use it. Now in your handout today, you have a website you can go to. If you don't know what your spiritual gifts are, it's a good starting point. Take a little survey online. It's not the be-all, end-all, but it's a starting point to figure out what your gifts are. Because you find your purpose in life by exercising your spiritual gifts. Peter says this. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provided. How do we exercise these gifts? In the strength of the Lord. So that in all things, God may be praised through Jesus Christ. What's the purpose of the gifts? Praise God. It's to praise God. To him, to the gift, the gift user, or to who? To God be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. The purpose for us using our gifts is to give God glory. Now this is a tool that's not normally in my toolbox. I don't know what you call these things either. What are they? Bellow? <laughs> I thought that was when you had like stuff bubbling up and you had to <clears throat> bellow. So my son Elijah, he's a great kid. He's here in the front row. And we have two, we're blessed to have two fireplaces in my house. And Elijah tells me that he is better at making fires than me. I will not admit that, but it could be true. Because what happens is that my fires start to go out. And 
man, I need to get this guy. And before you know it, you start to see a flame. And what God says is this. If you want to be on fire, you got to fan that flame of the gift of God in you. And there's two primary ways to do it. The first is simply to exercise your gift. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor. How? Serving the Lord. I grew up, and I was a really artistic kid. Could you figure that out? But when I went to college, I told my dad I might want to get a minor in art, and he said, don't bother, you won't make any money. <laughs> and it was probably good advice. So I took an occasional art class, but I kind of lost the ability to paint. I used to be good at painting and drawing. Now I stick to PowerPoint. If I picked up the paintbrush today or the pencil, I wouldn't be as good as I was back then because I'm a bit rusty. You know what I'm saying, Esther? I haven't used my gift. Now, if I use that gift and operate in that gift, over time, I'll get back to where I was and I may even exceed my abilities that I had before. Because here's the deal. God's gift and his call are what? Irrevocable. God doesn't give you a gift and say, I'm going to take that gift away. You haven't been a good steward. No, it's just like that fire. It just needs a little shh, 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 shh. You just got to start using your gift again. It's like a muscle. You know, you have as many muscles as you had five or ten years ago. But science says this. After the age of 30, if you don't do something to exercise those muscles, then every decade, you lose anywhere between 5 to 10% of body mass. You don't have less muscles. You just have less mass in your muscles and less strength and firmness. Your gifts are there. The question is, are you exercising them? Because if you exercise a muscle, it gets stronger. And if you exercise your gift... Guess what happens? It gets stronger. So how do you get on fire for God? Start exercising your gift. Second way is prayer. And we're going to, at the end of this time, have a, a time of prayer where we're going to pray for one another and pray for God to stir up that fire within you. For this reason, I remind you, Paul saying to Timothy, to fan in the flame like that fire. The gift of God, which is in you. It's already in you. There's a seed of God. It's already in you. You're gifted. What are you good at? You can say, I'm good at whatever it is. You know why? Because it's to the glory of God. Because a gift is a gift. I can say, I'm good at teaching. Why? Because it's a gift. Just like I can say, I like this shirt. Because it's a gift. My beautiful wife gave it to me. God's given me the gift to teach. What's your gift? It's in you. He says, which is in you through the laying on of hands. So this is prayer. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid or fearful, but gives us what? Power, love, and self-discipline or a sound mind, that ability to have stick to So do not be ashamed of the testimony about, of our Lord or me, his prisoner. Rather, join me in the suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Paul's saying, pray for one another to see those gifts manifested. And if you exercise your gift and you receive prayer, you'll start to feel that fire burning hotter. And don't get so concerned about the vehicle by which you use your gift. You don't have to have a platform to teach. You don't have to be a pastor to pastor. Start a small group. You can shepherd people. If you're faithful to shepherd five, God will give you six. Just be faithful. You need power. You need passion. You need proficiency. But last of all, you need personality. You need character. And God has provided that too. Look at the book of Galatians chapter five. 
Now, the works of the flesh, this is how you live without God, are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissension, divisions, envy. I mean, we're, we're going deep here, huh? Sounds like an episode of Jerry Springer or something. <laughs> Drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. There's one way to live. If you're living that way, it's not the kingdom way. But, he says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. And the interesting thing is the Bible says, do not get drunk in wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, I had a life before Christ, and I won't share the details of that life. Because it doesn't glorify God. But I can promise you this. Every time I went out, I was looking for primarily three things. Love, joy, and peace. Looking for not love, looking to be happy, and looking to get rid of stress and have peace. And don't you know that no matter how many times you go out, at the end, you still feel empty. You still feel like you need another night out. The next time is going to be better. Isaiah 55, 1 says this. Come all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and you will delight in the richest fare. He says, eat what's good. Abide in the fruit of the Holy Spirit. I love fruit. Any fruit lovers out there? Two things I like about fruit, it tastes good, and it's good for you. In all the attributes of the Holy Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, they're good for you, they're good for others. And it says, against such things there is no law. There's no limit. God's not ever going to say, you're too loving, not that da You got too much joy. We got to take some, religious people will say it. Why are you happy all the time? Not God. He loves joy. And the joy of the Lord is our what? Strength. He wants you to have joy. I love fruit. I love fruit. Especially apples. I'm really big on apples. Who are the people just like me who tried to get to bed as early as possible last night? Come on. Admit it. I see one hand. Oh, as early as possible. Me and Mark. Mark and I. You know what that is? That's a sign of Mark? Oldness. We're old, brother. We are old. O L D. So just for Mark and I, Mark, don't worry. You didn't miss anything. This is all that happened last night. Ready? <laughs> Happy New Year, Mark. That's it. <laughs> Jesus said this. By their fruit, you're going to know the folk. Right. Not by their talk. Not by the spiritual badges they put down their arm. Do you know I serve here and I serve there and then I serve here and then I serve there? Here's how you know. When you're around them, do you feel loved? Are they joyful or are they cranky? Are they negative or are they positive? Are they anxious all the time about what's going on in the world? <laughs> or are they at peace? Are they patient? Here's a good challenge for you. I learned it from an article a few years back. How about a one-word resolution? Just pick one fruit of the Holy Spirit and start praying to God, God, help me to bear this one fruit in 2017. And if you focus on one, what I found is that it's like an axiom to others like, if you focus on patient, you're going to be loving. Why? Because love is patient. So just pick one. Don't pick all nine. Just pick one. God wants our lives to bear fruit. What's my point in all of this? I think Peter says it best when he says in 2 Peter 1.3, his divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his glory and goodness. 
Repeat after me. I have the power through the Holy Spirit to live a godly life. Now say it with more confidence. Ready? I have the power. That's really weak. We're going to start over. I have the power through the Holy Spirit to live a godly life. Now say it like we're going to wake up the people in traditions, all right? I have the power through the Holy Spirit to live a godly life. Do you believe it? Take all the excuses that you've ever made about living a victorious Christian life, throw them in the trash, and meditate on the promises of God. Take the Word of God Believe it, eat it, let it soak into that brain of yours, and then ask God for his power to live it out. Eat the word, drink the spirit, and have fun doing it. And here's the cool thing. See, this message is not just a message for you or me, and it's not just about the one P person. It's about people. You see, we're a church, and in our American society, we think about me. Oh, I can have the power to live a different life, but it's not about you any more than it's all about me. It's about we, and what happened was when the Holy Spirit came upon the people, all of a sudden the equation changed and they changed the world. And the Bible says that they turned the world upside down. And don't you know that if you turn the world right now upside down, it becomes right side up. Now just in a minute, I have a picture to show you what it looks like if in this new year, Steve, we as a church body and as a church family, especially us as pastors, live a life filled with the Holy Spirit and walk in unity. Those two things. We operate in our gifts. We operate in the fruit of the Spirit. We just live a life if we do this. Now, this is the truth, Steve, I'm telling you. This, may, this, this next slide may also be the means of my termination. <laughs> but remember, first and foremost, it's the truth, Okay. This is what we would look like. <laughs> Just please, do not take a picture of that and send that to Scott, okay? <laughs> please. <laughs> I'm going to need to work those tools. You got a need for an extra guy, Mark? <laughs> What's the point? The whole point is this. God has given us, us, the power of the Spirit to accomplish the big, hairy, audacious goal of discipling, teaching people what it means to follow Jesus. And no one person can do this. We need to do it. We need to work together, set aside those things that keep us from working together smoothly, operate in the fruit of the Spirit, not in our flesh, and keep praying a simple prayer. God, fill me with the Holy Spirit. Immerse me. Baptize me. Because I can't do the job you've given me to do in my own strength. I need your power. And if you only take one thing out of this lesson today, my encouragement is this. In 2017, more than in 2016, would you pray, God, give me your Holy Spirit. 
And some of us, we're, we're battling with sin. We're battling with issues, behead, besetting sins, sins, sins that knock us over. And we get so focused on the sin. Or you're, you're battling the issue of a relationship. You're so focused on the relationship. But it's like this. See, if I had dirt or dust in here, I could try to get my hand in there and get it out. But the easier way is just to fill myself with the Spirit of God until all that stuff comes out of me. So you can either focus on your sin or you can focus on the Spirit. You choose. Because you can't overdose on the Holy Ghost. Just bring it more. Let's try. I like that attitude. 